right, good morning. Good morning, church. If you guys uh, have a Bible, would you turn to Colossians chapter 1? Uh, we're taking a break from Hebrews uh, as our pastor Mark Dad Pop uh, is in California right now. Uh, he should be pretty soon going on uh, to teach at the Ark Montebello. So we'll pray for him and that the church would be blessed as we have. If you need a Bible, would you raise your hand and an usher can get you one and turn to the book of Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1. We're going to read from verse 9 down to verse 12 in a uh, message that I have titled, No Replacement. If you're a note taker, I encourage you to take notes. No Replacement. So we're going to start in verse 9. We'll read, we'll pray, and we'll get into our study this morning. Colossians 1.9 it says this, For this reason... We also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him and being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Verse 12 Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Let's pray. So, Lord, we thank you for your word, and as we have opened to God, would you speak to us, God? This is your revealed revelation of who you are, of your heart, of your desire for our lives. And we want to have ears to hear and a heart to receive. God, we pray for our pastor as he's uh, about to uh, share, Lord, with a church in California, God. We just pray that for a blessing upon him, Lord, and upon uh, that congregation as they get to receive what we receive every week, Lord, uh, here. We're so blessed to have a, a pastor who teaches us the word. We do pray, God, for ourselves that we would uh, be attentive, that we would grow, and Lord, that we would walk away knowing that there is no replacement for the Word of God in the Christian's life, that we would walk away knowing the centrality of the Word of God for the Christian's walk and witness, and Lord, that we would stand firm upon it, we ask in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. All right, well, um, Paul, in hearing of the faith, of those in Colossae, he never been to Colossae, but, but because of his work, a church was planted out of it, we believe from Ephesus, and he hears from Epaphras that there is a church and their faith and their love is booming. It's just, it's being heard throughout the whole world. And I love it in verse, uh, I believe it is in verse let me see, beep, 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 beep. verse 5, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Their hope of the gospel led to love and faith, and it was heard by all. And so Epaphras has come to Paul with this exciting news, which led Paul to have uh, joy and excitement in his heart. And he explains that in verses 3 to verse 8. But along with a good testimony of this church came a, uh, a concern from the enemy. Now you guys know, but it's, it goes without saying, that the enemy does not stop in trying to keep those who trust God from experiencing his peace and fruitfulness in their lives. How many of you guys have seen that in your life? He's, he's ruthless, right? He's relentless. He just, he keeps coming at you one moment after another after another. The enemy is real. And often Satan's tactics are either false beliefs right? Or distractions from God's goodness or his character or from his word. I mean, you have been there being overwhelmed with a situation with emotion where your mind is just kind of numb to the things of God because of this situation. Or maybe you've fallen into sin and so you are so gripped with condemnation and you begin to look at God as a, a God full of, uh, that's angry at you, He's not happy with you. He doesn't like you anymore because of your sin. Or maybe it was a sin that you just can't, you keep going in. So you begin to see God in the wrong way and you're distracted and you're not fruitful anymore. 
Or maybe, you know, just like uh, for me as a parent, I get up early. I try to, right? Amen? Anyone parents? I mean, we got a, a twin mom here, you know, Erica, God bless you. Um, no sleep for the rest of your life. So, um, but, you know, you, you get up early to spend time with Jesus. And, and right when you go to say, and Lord, the baby wakes up or the kids start crying. And so now you, you have to go tend to them. Or you lock the door and you just leave them in there for a little bit, you know. Um, or, uh, or you know, you, you sit down and you open up your Bible app and all the text messages start coming in. Isn't it true? Have you guys been there? And the emails go off and the text messages go off. Or you're in the middle of the afternoon and you go to spend time with Jesus and the verdict is in for the Deb case. You're like, yeah, Lord, can you wait a second? You know, there's just, he uses distractions, or false beliefs because of how we feel or experiences we've had. At the time in Colossae, the the false teaching was called Gnosticism. And a good way, because I'm uh, Warren Wearsby said it best, so we'll just quote him. To begin with, it, this heresy promised people such a close union with God that they would achieve a spiritual perfection. Spiritual fullness could be theirs only if they entered into the teachings and ceremonies prescribed. That was Gnosticism. You had to know what we know, and you can, we'll only give it to you unless you, you come into our camp. It said really that Jesus was good, but you needed more to be close to God. Let me tell you something. If anyone tries to add to Jesus ever, it's a false teaching. Jesus doesn't need anything, amen? Jesus is enough. Jesus is all that you and I need. And today, you know, the culture's agendas and spirituality, mysticism, um, they're they're all just just bombarding us. The overemphasis of experience over just a simple promotion that Jesus is enough. I mean, it's everywhere. It's creeping into the church, right? We want to know God's will if we get goosebumps or we want to see writings in the skies. We want an experience to keep us going. You know, I, Warren, Warren Wearsby also said, it's not up there, but he says, you don't need a new experience. You need to grow in the experience you've already had in salvation. You, you don't need another thing, <laughs> And this is what the Gnostics were saying. You need something else other than Jesus. And so Paul in his prayer here begins to equip the church and remind them of of what they need and that they already have it. And that's my prayer for us this morning is that we would be reminded and equipped to remain steadfast in God's word. That you and I would know at the end of this teaching that Jesus is enough and you need no other source of truth than God's word. You don't need to listen to the culture and its beckoning. You have the God of heaven and earth speaking to you and to me as we open up God's word, guys. Simply put, there is no replacement for God's word in the Christian's life, amen? There is no replacement for God's word. It's so central to our walk and our witness, and we need to remain upon it. And so in Paul's prayer, he has kind of two prayer points and three outcomes because of God answering this prayer. Three things that flow from these two prayers. And so if you would, look at verse 9 as we look at his first prayer point, and it is this, that they would be filled with the knowledge of God. Look at verse 9. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, And to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. The first thing I want to point out, and it should encourage you and it should encourage me, is that we can know God's will. You can know the will of God. There's a lot of talk about the will of God, right? We we have decisions to make every day. It's some bigger and some smaller. What? The, the what, the where, the why, the how, the who, right? Singles, the who, you know? And, and there's so many things that we're, we're seeking God about because, because as we open the Bible, we realize that our name isn't in here. <laughs> he doesn't say who we should marry and where we should live and what to do, right? And so we, we spend our time praying and asking God to lead us and to guide us and direct us. And we often say, God, I want to know your will for my life. You know, I get to do the youth ministry here, and, and that's one of the big questions is, what is God's will for my life? I don't know what to do if I should go here for college or there for college. You might be struggling with a work position. Should I take this job or should I not? 
And so you kind of have been there when you're seeking God's will. When you're waiting upon God's will. You should bring your steps before the Lord. Amen. And you should wait upon him and not be hasty. But let me give you a, a, just some wisdom. Is that waiting on God does not mean doing nothing. If you're waiting on God today, if you've, if you've said, man, I'm just waiting on the Lord, that doesn't mean you don't do anything. Actually, waiting on God means this, that though I don't know the specifics, I do know God's general will for my life. The will of God can and is known through the word of God. You see, God's word is God's will. The way that I reveal what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, what I'm desiring is through language. In any kind of language, but I speak, I express myself. God, listen, has expressed himself to us in his word through eyewitnesses who were led and empowered by the Holy Spirit to communicate to us God's heart. And so we can know God's general will for our life. And so while we are waiting on the specifics, which God will answer in his timing, you got to know that, in his timing. So, you know, if you have an hour left and you're like, God, you need to come through in this hour, maybe, maybe you just need to say no. Don't make a hasty decision. Wait on the Lord. He'll lead you. He'll give you the peace. But while you're waiting for the specifics, we should spend our time being busy about what he has revealed to us. This is what he means by the knowledge of his will. You can know God's will. And when you and I begin to be busy about what he has revealed, this is what I've noticed, and you, you might be able to attest to it, that we often just supernaturally, naturally end up walking in what God's will is for our life. The door is just open and you take steps of faith. You're not waiting and looking at every door. You're walking with God. Your eyes are on Jesus and he's leading you. He's directing you. And so we need to, guys, be spending time in the word of God to what is revealed and being obedient to it. If you are not spending time with God, but you're waiting on him to answer you, how are you going to know when God speaks? And how are you going to know what God speaks? The, the, the way that God speaks to you and to me, the most clearest way is through his word. That's why he's given it to us. And God's word, guys, is chock full of commands and thoughts that as believers, we sh- should be a part of our lives. Can I read to you a few? If you're a note taker, get ready. Right? Ready? Verse 1, John six twenty nine. This is the work of God. That you believe in him whom he sent. So this is more for you who are maybe an unbeliever. Maybe you haven't put your faith in Jesus, but you, you might say, oh, well, I pray, and you know what? I'm just kind of in this place of waiting on God. You want to know what God's waiting for you is to accept his son. You're waiting on him, and he's waiting on you to come to Jesus. That is the first will of God. The Bible says that God desires for all to be saved and come to, to repentance and come to faith in Jesus. So the will of God for your life is to believe on Jesus Christ. That is our first will of God for our lives. And you say, well, Seth, I've, I've accepted Christ. Okay, here's another one. Matthew 28, very, very, um, you know, known scripture. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So God's will for your life is to make disciples. That's the will of God. Are you, if you're wondering what the will of God is, the will of God is for you to make disciples. To use your gifts that God, through the Holy Spirit, has given you. And to serve and to help other people grow in their walk and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Are you waiting to see what ministry to be a part of? Start where you're at with making disciples. Make disciples of your kids. Make disciples of your siblings, of your friends, of your coworkers, and watch what God does as he leads you. Watch what doors open. Or here's another one. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. 
not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more the, as you see the day approaching. It is God's will for you and I to be in community. It is you, it, we are to be a part of the church and encouraging one another in the church. Are you in the waiting season of waiting for confirmation? Then God's heart for you is to be a part of a community, to be a part of a church. You know, I love, I love when we come to church and, and we come faithfully and you're praying about something and then someone gets up and uh, teaches a message and it speaks right to that situation as if God was saying, hello, that's it. You guys have ever been there before? Or you're talking with someone and you're getting counsel with someone and they just, they kind of speak to you in a way that you're like, oh, wow, man, I've been, I've been really praying for that. And you walk away encouraged and you walk away full of faith to take that step that, that God has been leading you to. All right, it's impossible to live the Christian walk apart from the church. I mean, this is our holy huddle. <laughs> this is where we come to, to get encouraged and be reminded so that we can go back out and be witnesses. Two more. Sorry, it's a fire hose of scripture. First Thessalonians chapter 4, 3. Here's very specific wills of God. For this is the will of God. That's pretty specific. Your sanctification. All right, ready? That you should abstain from sexual immorality. So Seth, what's the will of God for my life? That you would abstain from sexual immorality. That you would grow in your walk with God as a Christian. You know, one of the biggest places that we're waiting for, especially if you're single, is who's going to be my spouse? Who am I going to marry? It is very unwise for you to be praying and waiting for God for a spouse and then walking in sexual immorality. That's going to cloud your judgment and, and, and really just get you off track. If anything, you should want to be the spouse that you're praying for and abstain from sexual immorality until you're married. Or in 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. Ouch. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You say, Seth, what's the will of God? Well, well God wants you to rejoice always. How you guys doing? Pray without ceasing. And in everything give thanks. Ow, gosh. Some things give thanks. No, it says everything, right? So these are the will of God's for life. And, and that's just some. I mean, the, the last thing you read in your scripture was the will of God for your life. And so we should, instead of getting so bogged down with the specifics, let's focus on what God has revealed to you and to me. And listen, if you're in that season of waiting, listen, trust the goodness and faithfulness of God. He's always on time, amen? He's not late. He, know, he, he, he created you. He knows, he knows the deadline. He knows what's coming up, and he knows what's best for you. God will come through at the right time. But you, as you wait, be continually filled with the knowledge of God's will and wisdom and understanding. You know, I, I tell the students this a lot, and I, I'll share with you, that if, if <laughs> you're wondering if something God's, if it's God's will, if it doesn't come out of God's word, it's not God's will for your life. It's not God's will that you cheat on your spouse. You don't have to pray about it. You don't have to say, well, Lord, I mean, no, you, you don't do that. It's not God's will for your life. I always tell them to be a drug dealer. It's just like no brainer. God, no, you're not glorifying God in that, that area, you know. No missionaries as drug dealers, okay. Um, God, God has written out to us in his word what he desires, so if it's lining up with God's will and you don't see that God is, has spoken against it, okay, well then now, now let's start praying. Let's start waiting. Let's get counsel. Let's take steps of faith. Sometimes you gotta take a step, man. It's okay. God's gracious, amen? So listen, there is no replacement for God's word where you will know God's will. You're not gonna find God's will in any other source but his word, amen? And we need to, we need to remain uh, on that we need to stand firm on that now another point to make is notice he says in verse 9 and i ask that you may be filled so listen the the being filled with god's will is a work of god he's asking god 
in a pass, it's a passive voice, meaning this is going to happen to you. I'm praying that God will do something to you. And what that is, is being filled with the, the wisdom, or I'm sorry, the, the will of God and all spiritual wisdom and spiritual understanding. This is something that God does to us. It's what's something that happens to us. Being filled, it means this, to cause to abound, to furnish or supply liberally. And when used in this context, it speaks of God, the Holy Spirit, supplying spiritual and practical matters to men and women who are spending time in God's word. Here's a great picture of it. I love this one. Exodus chapter 31, verses 2 and 3. He says, see, I have called by name Bezalel, 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 and the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. Notice what verse 3 says. And I have filled him, God has done this, with the spirit of God, and this is where it comes out, in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and look how practical, in all manner of workmanship. So as we approach the word of God and place ourselves under God's word, we need to prayerfully read and prayerfully listen. You know, many of us can come to God's word as a textbook, getting ready for the next test, and we can intellectually grasp the truths and the ins and outs of scripture, but it is only through the Holy Spirit that we can gain spiritual wisdom and understanding for our day-to-day life because the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is our teacher. In John 14, it says this, These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So when you come to God's word, though it's good to intellectually know, you need to know the word in and out. It's, it, you study yourself to, be, to uh, show yourself approved, but it is God who is filling you with spiritual wisdom and understanding in the will of God. It, 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 that's a work of God. And so you could pray something like this when you come to the word. God, would you take the timeless word of God and speak it into my life in a timely manner? God, would you take what is timely or timeless and, and will last forever, and would you make it and apply it to my life in the here and the now? That is the work of God. I can't come up with that intellect i need the the spirit of god who is the author of god's word to teach it to me who who greater to have when you're reading a book than the author there to explain what he meant and that's who we have in the holy spirit so we need to come to god's word in a prayerful manner so there is no replacement for the word of god that can supply this wisdom and understanding from his spirit There's no other source of truth that will give you that wisdom that you need to live a life worthy of God. Only God's word can do that. There's no replacement for God's word. Now, not only does Paul pray that they would be filled with God's word, but secondly, notice in verse 10 that they would walk worthy of the Lord, which is an outcome of the first when you're filled with God's knowledge of, the, of his will, you then live a life worthy of the Lord. Verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord. Now, this doesn't mean that you're trying to be worthy of the Lord. That would imply that you and I are saved by good works. And let me just, you know, clear the air. You're not. <laughs> the Bible says that we have been saved by grace through faith. That's not, a, not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So we have not been saved by our good works. So there's nothing you and I can do to become worthy of the Lord. But as we get saved, the saying is that we have not been saved by good works, but what? For good works. Unto good works. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So God has saved us for good works, but he has not saved us because of good works. And so the outflow of a life that is filled with the knowledge of his will is a life that walks worthy of the Lord. Literally, it means you match the quality of life that Jesus lived. Now those are some pretty big sandals to fill, right? Or I don't know what he wore. Maybe he wore sandals. 
Though we can't do this perfectly, we, by God's grace, can be examples of the life of Jesus as we are filled with the knowledge of his will. And how do I know what the Son of God was like but through the word of God? And how, how do I live that out unless I'm being obedient to the word of God? Listen, obedience is not a cuss word, okay? Obedience is not a cuss word in the Christian faith. It is a loving response to the love of God. It's, a, it's an outflow of your love because of God's love for you. So we ought to be obedient, but we do it not in the flesh, but according to his spirit and by his grace. So if you are not spending time with the spirit of God in the word of God, then you and I will never walk worthy of the son of God. One will always beget the other. So if you're not in God's word, you can't walk worthy of God. Right? There's no replacement for God's word that will lead you to live a life worthy of the Lord. Not perfect, but worthy, reflective, demonstrating the life of Christ to those in our community. And so the word of God then produces in us three different things that w- help us to walk worthy of the Lord. If you're taking notes, the first one is this, that we become fruitful and pleasing to God. Look at verse 10 again. It says that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. You see, the word of God produces in us a life that is fruitful and pleasing to God. Jesus, you guys know in John 15, when he talks about that he is the vine and we are the branches, he later on in verses seven and eight says this, if you abide in me, You live in me, make your home with me, spend time with me, connected with me, and my words abide in you. My word lives in you. It finds a place to rest in you. It finds a place to, it it finds its home in you. Then you will ask what you desire, which will be what he desires, because his word is in us, and it shall be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples you know the best way to pray according to god's will any of you guys ever struggle with that man i don't know how to pray according to god's will listen pray the word of god if the word of god is god's will then when we pray the word of god we're praying according to the will of god and god is going to answer that prayer so pray for your kids lord i pray that they would be filled with the knowledge of of your will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding god's going to bless that prayer god will answer that prayer so pray according to the will of god by praying the word of God. See, I see we bear fruit in our lives when we are dependent upon God's spirit and upon his word. And notice he says in every work, not just on your Sunday ministry work or Wednesday night ministry, but in every good work. How many, we can all do good works throughout our week. And, and the word of God will, will produce in us fruit to bear and, and to be the, and do those good works. Right? To reflect Christ in that way. To love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So as we're waiting and seeking and and walking in obedience to God's word, he's giving us the wisdom and discernment to live these things out. And then I love what it says here. Notice what it says at the very end. And increasing in the knowledge of God. Now listen, this doesn't mean that you're intellectually increasing in the knowledge of God. This is what the word means. I love it. It means this. That you and I are um, maturing in or growing up in the knowledge of God. We're filling into the the, the will of God. You know, like we said, those are some big sandals to fill, but we begin to fill them a little bit more as we're obedient to God's word. We're increasing, we're maturing in the knowledge of God as we live it out to please God with our lives. Guys, God doesn't just want big-headed disciples, but maturing disciples who are maturing in the word. And that's one of the best ways. If you ever have trouble with um, memorizing scripture, I know I do, because maybe it's because I'm lazy, but I I do struggle with that at times. The best way to memorize scripture is to be obedient to that scripture. So you take a scripture and you walk it out, and then you have an example or an experience or an application of that word that you can always relate to when you hear that verse. 
So obedience and, and, and walking out and, and bearing fruit by the word of God, man, it helps you to mature in the word of God. It's amazing. Guys, there is no replacement for the word of God that produces fruit in our lives to please God. If you leave the word of God and you connect yourself to some other source, it is not going to produce fruit that pleases God. It's not going to produce a fruit that God is pleased by. You're going to bear fruit. We're vines. That's what we do. We bear fruit. And Jesus said, I am the true vine, meaning that there's fake vines. There's false vines that you can be connected to, and none of them will produce the fruit that pleases God. Only when we stand upon the word of God, by the spirit of God. Secondly, the second thing it produces is that we are filled with his power. Look at verse 11. It says, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. So as you and I are filled with the knowledge of God's will, we are then filled with power for life's circumstances. The Holy Spirit fills us with the power that is needed to live out God's word, both in being fruitful, but also in patience and long suffering. And notice the source of this power. It says it, by his glorious, wonderful power. That's a power source that doesn't run out. That's the greatest generator ever, right? I mean, he just, that's the greatest source of power. And you know what's so cool is that I'm in daily need of power to live out the Christian life, and he is so gracious to give it as much as I come to him. Are you feeling weak in your walk and struggling? Are you struggling with sin? Maybe you're, you have a habitual sin in your life that you just, you keep saying, man, I'm so weak in this. No, God has given you power, friend. God has unlimited power and, and everything you need for life and godliness. But you cannot find that apart from God's word. You cannot find that apart from abiding in Jesus. Now, I love what this power is given for. Notice what he says here, for patience and long suffering. That's, here you go, ready? Hard circumstances Ooh, and hard people. <laughs> you guys ever had one of those? Don't hit your husband or wife, okay? Hard circumstances and hard people. Hard circumstances, trials and tribulations. We've all been through them. The word patience implies, it means remaining under trial for a period of time. So God strengthens you to endure the trial that you're in. That's when you feel the weakest. That's when God's strength is seen the most. Remember what he said to Paul? He goes, my grace is sufficient. It's made perfect in your weakness. So, so God is strengthening us to remain under trials or hard circumstances, but then he's also giving us the power for hard people in our lives, which is what the word long-suffering means. You want to know the definition of long-suffering? Flip the words. Suffering long. You, you guys laugh because you know some of those people. Can I tell you, though? Um, we are all in the middle of our sanctification. So you might have some people in your mind that you have to suffer along with, and they have you on their mind too. You know why? It's because we are imperfect people chasing a perfect God. You and I are in the middle of our sanctification. We all fall short of the glory of God, and we're all going to make mistakes. And bearing each other's burdens and, and, and walking in community with people, it takes long suffering at times, right? But hasn't God been so long-suffering with you and me? I mean, could you imagine if God was like us? We would have been booted when we were born. You know what I mean? Like, that's like, dude, like, I, I'm, done with, I'm done with this crying baby. You know what I mean? Like, and some of us are still crying babies in our walk, just born again, needing milk, needing care, needing t tender, you know, t uh, tending to. So how could we receive the long-suffering of God and not extend it to people? Now, I'm guilty with it. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't like the long-suffering part of my walk. But God has been long-suffering with me. And you know what else? Notice the last two words here. With, say it with me, joy. Ugh. You guys, none of you guys said it. Say it again. With, oh gosh, with joy 
You know, some of you guys, you guys are patient people, but you don't do it with joy. Or some of you guys are long-suffering, but you don't like it. Ah, I'm that way. Right? We, we, we know how to, we go to the sources that teach us wisdom on how to, you know, your face should look like this when you're dealing with hard people. And you should, you know, and, and, and we can do that, but there's not joy in my heart. You know what a definition for joy is? Check this out. What's due to grace. So when you experience the grace of God and you recognize the grace of God, the next thing that comes out of your heart towards, towards his grace is what the Bible defines as joy. It's not emotion. Joy is not an emotion, right? Joy is not a, uh, a feeling. <laughs> joy is a response to God's grace. And so we can, with long suffering and patience, endure with joy because we're recognizing that God is giving us the grace to do so. Amen? And so we can choose to be joyful and suffer along with people. We can choose, to, uh, we can choose joy and remain under the trial for a season. We can weep with those who weep, and we can, we can rejoice with those who rejoice with joy because we know that God is giving us the grace to do so. And if I want to reflect God, Jesus in a walk that's worthy of the Lord, well, I need his power when circumstances or, or tough people come my way. And that only comes as I'm filled with the knowledge of God's will. So listen, there is no replacement for God's word that can give you the power you need to be patient and long-suffering. Because God sees the heart. You can fake the funk, and I'm thankful you do, (laughs) because I don't want conflict all the time. But God knows our heart when we're doing it with joy and when we're not. Lastly, the third thing, not only are, are we fruitful and pleasing to God when we're in God's word, Not only are we filled with his power, but we become full of his praise. Look at verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance and the light. Lastly, when you and I are filled with the knowledge of God's will, there is in us a heart of worship and thanks. You guys experienced that before? Reading the word and just get worshipful? Break out and praise? You know, you make me want, you know, so because God's will, guys, listen, is not just so that you work well or serve well. Some of us, that's how we come to God's word. Okay, help me to work really hard. Help me to, to serve really, really good. Help me to do it to the best of my ability. That's, that's true. But God's will also for your life is that you would rest. God's word is that you would rest in him that you would learn to find your resting place in his grace, to remember his goodness and his faithfulness, and then to just respond in that heart of worship. Again, joy, what's due to his grace. He says here, we thank the Father who has qualified us. Now, what does it mean to be qualified? It means to make sufficient, to make able, What is he making us sufficient for? What is he making us able for? Well, he says it right after, who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Guys, we are always reminded, as you and I come to the word of God, of the gospel. The word here, just that he has made us, he has qualified us, that's the gospel. Because I was not qualified, but through Jesus I am qualified. I was, I was not going to inherit eternal life and salvation in the light, but because of Jesus, I am now able to receive the inheritance in the light with the saints. That is the gospel. When you and I get into the word of God, we are then reminded as we come to challenging passages, as God is maybe speaking to us and convicting us, we are then reminded to turn to the cross. We're reminded of his grace and his gospel. We are reminded that we have eternal life now, that we are children of God, and that it's nothing of ourselves. It's all that he has done. Jesus has done it all. And he gave to us, guys, this is the beauty of the gospel. He has given to us his righteousness when we trust him by faith. 
The word is he has imputed to us his righteousness. He has clothed us in his holiness and his perfection so that right now you do not stand before God in your sin. You see yourself according to the last time you messed up. God sees you according to his son. You see yourself lacking faith. God sees you in his son because of grace. Nothing that you did, nothing that I did, it's all because of what Jesus has done. And then he's reconciled us back to the Father now because we have his righteousness. See, a holy God can't be in relationship with a, with a sinner. But Jesus Christ is the peace treaty between God and man. He, he's here making peace through the blood of his cross. And so if you have not placed your faith in Jesus today, you need to be reconciled to God through Jesus. You need to sign the peace treaty with God by accepting his son, Jesus, who he has sent and has taken on the judgment of God that you and I deserve. Because if you are to pass on from this life into the next without the righteousness and the blood of Jesus upon you, God who is just in righteousness will judge you for that. You and I are judged not because of just our sin, but our rejection of Jesus. So if you were to reject Jesus today, I, I would encourage you, don't click out of here if you're watching online. Don't leave this, this place without getting right with God. By sign that peace treaty with Jesus. Say, Jesus, I, I need peace with God. I know I'm a sinner. I need, I need salvation. And then you know what's awesome is that you're filled with thanks to the Father. Because he's qualified you the moment you put your faith in Jesus. Peace forever. But for us who have accepted Jesus, man, aren't we in daily need of remembering that we've been saved by grace through faith? Aren't we in daily uh, need of remembering the work of Jesus on the cross? We, We are in daily need of remembering because we are in daily falling short of the glory of God. I need to be, I need to be reminded of this goodness. I need to be thankful for the work of Jesus on the cross. And it's when I remember the great and costly truth, I thank the Father. It just sprouts out of my heart. It sprouts out of your heart. We thank the Father who has from eternity past planned this great salvation for you and me and has brought it to reality in this time, in this space, in this, in this moment. So guys, there is no replacement for the word of God that will lead you to worship God. If you leave the word of God, you will not be provoked to worship God in spirit and in truth. We learned that in Hebrews last week, right? But we see Jesus. You guys remember that? But we see Jesus. But what happens when we don't see Jesus? When we don't see everything under man, when we see how everything is out of control, well, our worship turns to worry, our praise to panic, and our problems become bigger and bigger because our view of God grows smaller and smaller. The only way that I am going to be filled with the awe and the majesty and the glory of God is if I stand upon his word. He has revealed himself to us in his word. Guys, listen, simply put, there is no replacement for God's word. You cannot, you cannot survive as a Christian without God's word. You know, me, me and you, we eat daily. We are to feast upon God's word daily. There's no replacement for God's word where you will find God's will, that you will be supplied with wisdom and understanding, where you can live a worthy life that produces fruit that pleases God, that gives you the power to be patient and long-suffering, that leads you to worship. Guys, only the word of God can do that. And that's what he tells them who's dealing with the Gnostics. You don't need a new knowledge. You don't need a new experience. You don't need nothing else but Jesus and him crucified. And so guys, I want to encourage you as as the uh, ushers come up, we're going to remember Jesus through communion today. Amen? What a great way to end this teaching and remembering him. And and, and as, as they come up and as they're passing out, guys, do not leave God's word to build on another foundation. Do not listen to the schemes and distractions of the enemy or the advances of the agenda of our culture. Stand fast upon God's word. Stand fast. And those who stand fast, it will show in time. Fruit will abound. Joy will abound. Thanksgiving will abound in your life. So do not not leave 
remain strong and unmovable upon the word of God. Um, as they pass it out and we sing this next worship song, I encourage you to s- take some time to be quiet before the Lord and to thank him. Thank him for this gospel. Remember what he has done for you. Remember who you were and who you are now. And if you've gotten off of that foundation, take some time to repent and say, God, help me to come back upon it. Help me to grow deep into it. Help my roots to grow down in it. All right? And so um, let's spend some time in worship, and then we'll come back and we'll take communion together.